great, you're still bilingual, all right. It is uh, wonderful to be here with you this morning, and I really appreciate that introduction because first, this is, that's, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to kind of look at Israel and the Middle East, and we're also going to talk about the, the biblical foundation for what's going on and, and see how, if we can, look and see how it looks for the future. Um, before I do that, I do uh, agree and want to just thank West Hills Church for, there's just so many reasons to be grateful to your church and um, first, your support of Chosen People Ministries, really even before me with Dr. Uh, Dan and Madeline Goldberg. So always, every time I come here, I'm just so grateful to you for your love for the Jewish people, Chosen People Ministries, as well as our outreach. Also, of course, just West Hills Church. I mean, we partner with you. Um, we get the privilege of sharing this building with you in terms of of worship and ministry and celebrating the Lord in that, uh, with uh, Adat Yeshua, of which I'm an elder of. And so I thank you for that as well. And we're grateful to, to the building and to our friendship. And then, of course, of course, also the Julians. As Pastor Scott said, we've known the Julians for a long time. Our children and our friends, we're friends. And, and we're just serving all of us, really just serving the Lord, seeking his will, desiring to follow him and do what he's called us to do on this side of eternity until we go to be with him or, or he returns. And so we're just grateful for that partnership. I wanted to say a few things about Chosen People Ministries. Okay. It worked, it worked uh, during... <laughs> I'm probably doing something wrong. Um, it was... Uh, anyway, so Chosen People Ministries, we are uh, been around since 1894. As Pastor Scott said, we, we desire to be everywhere where there's a tangible Jewish population that we can reach out to them and minister the gospel to them. Um, my ministry, I'm here as the L.A. branch leader for Chosen People Ministries. L.A. is home to... Still not working. Home to over uh, 600,000 Jewish people. Southern California, between San Diego and Santa Barbara, probably home to close to a million Jewish people, and especially if you factor in the whole state of California. So this is an important area for you and for me to be in partnership as we seek to influence and minister to the Jewish people uh, the Word of God. And so that's part of what we do. Lisa and I, we just finished uh, a children's camp, youth and children's camp, which we had a great time. It was a real blessing, especially after covid because uh, we had to cancel, really, we canceled all of our ministries uh, last year in terms of our, our outreach, face-to-face uh, -face ministry. We did more online, internet evangelism, things like that. We continue to do our Isaiah 53 campaign, which I have a couple of books and other literature out at the back table. But this year was really special for us that we were able, that's our mission statement, that we were able to, is it going to work here? Yes that we were able to minister to the children after being a year off. It was a real blessing. It was a great encouragement. We had a number of salvations. We had uh, a young, uh, unsaved Jewish person, a uh, young, young man come to faith from a Russian background. So it was a real beautiful time, as well as a lot of recommitments and just a, a, a special time of, of fellowship, both with the counselors and with the campers, uh, something that we really think the next generation, part of our outreach here in Los Angeles, area is to the next generation, something that Lisa and I uh, really believe in, are committed to, and have been doing for decades, and, and I know you are too, and so that's part of it. Isaiah 53, that is the great messianic prophecy. That messianic prophecy, more than any other, has brought Jewish people either to faith or has uh, confirmed, strengthened their faith. It's a beautiful prophecy. It also teaches you how to be a servant. It's not just a messianic prophecy that tells us who the Messiah is. Of course, Jesus of Nazareth, God the Son, the second person of the triune God, eternal God. But, but it also tells you how to be a servant in our faith if you want to follow his example. And so it's a really powerful. We send out tens of thousands of these books. People are calling in and we, or, or emailing in and we send out the book and then we follow up with them. So that's also a part of our ministry, especially during COVID. So if you are interested in partnering with us, learning more, getting our personal prayer letter, when you came in, you would have received this brochure. If you want to go ahead and open up the brochure really quickly, we're going to participate in an ancient Messianic Jewish tradition. It's called the tearing of the slip. <laughs> and so on the count of three, if you like, you can make some noise and tear that slip. 
And you can fill out your name and email if that's all you want to do. That's fine. Phone number if you want to participate with us in any way. Your address, if you still like snail mail or regular mail, you go ahead and do that too. You can meet me at the literature table in the back and hand these slips to me. Uh, and we'll go ahead and stay in contact with you. I send out my personal prayer letter. Our personal prayer letter goes out once a month, as well as our international newsletter to let you know what's going on in the Jewish world, the, the outreach to the Jewish people on a monthly basis. So you can go ahead and fill that out. It's also, obviously, it's a great just affirmation and... Um, encouragement to us when when people fill out the slip and it does give you an opportunity to give to our ministry we are a support raised mission if that is what god is putting on your heart to do well i'm going to go ahead and pray one more thing before i pray and get started and that is this book here is one of the pieces of literature that we have on the table messiah and the passover uh i i wrote one of the chapters so people always say did you write a book i'm not really much of a writer unfortunately god has not really gifted at least at this point in time uh, that way, I know, I just apologize, I repent, I just blame God, it's not his fault, it's mine, sorry Lord, but I do have a chapter, chapter 12, which is a cool chapter, 12, 12 tribes, 12 apostles, anyway, uh, in, that, in that book, Messiah and the Passover, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, to our ministry's heart, the Passover also points to who the Messiah is, it's a great evangelistic and disciple-making tool, so if that, that is uh, something you might be interested in, you could take a look at that book as well as other uh, um, books on the table. So, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Israel. We thank you for the church. We thank you, Lord God, that we're here today breathing, enjoying fellowship, community. And Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray that we would, that each person here would get something out of it, that we would see it, that it would speak to our hearts, that we would get a, a word from you of how to live it out and apply it, the power of your spirit working in us, Lord God, to minister to our neighbor, our family, our friends, our community, to the Jewish people. Lord, I pray for our Jewish neighbors, our Jewish family members, our Jewish work associates. We all have one living here in West Hills and San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles. And so I pray, Lord God, for that Jewish person that's on our heart right now and ask that you would, that you would give us opportunity, Lord, that your spirit would open up their heart and that the grace would come in and that they would be saved. And so, Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. Now, Lord, as we look into your message, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the church. We pray for those being persecuted. And, of course, Lord, we pray for our nation, that our nation would turn to you and believe in Yeshua, my, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. There, I, sometimes I'll say Yeshua. That's the Hebrew way to say Jesus. It means salvation. So if I say, if I slip into Hebrew, that's what I'm, what I'm saying there. And so Israel... There it is. There's a map of Israel, a modern state. You got in green, the West Bank. You got in purple, Gaza Strip. And then in the gold, the Golan Heights. Those are kind of considered the quote-unquote occupied territories or territories that were not part of Israel pre-1967. Um, Israel is a place that I love. I've been there uh, five times. And um, you know, it's just really special uh, place and I, I pray that you you get the opportunity to go there. I pray we get the opportunity to go there again. You never know with the way the world is is going uh, today. I'm scheduled to go back with my wife um, in June of 2022, so you can pray for that. We're hoping to take another youth trip. That's part of what I do. I take youth, high school age uh, students to Israel to so that they'll experience, grow in their faith, experience. Israel and have a heart for Jewish people and learn some Jewish outreach. And Israel is about the size of the whole, the whole area is about the size of, they say, New Jersey. And if you take out those color areas, it's about the size of Rhode Island. This is Israel in the Middle East, that era which shifted. Okay, so I'm, I'm Gen X. I don't really do technology well. I'm sure when this wasn't working, it was definitely my fault. <laughs> so I'm way behind. I'm like, I'm rather just send you mail. Email sort of works for me. But anyway, so, but you can probably see Israel and um, that's the rest of the Middle East. In 1948, when Israel became a state, every single part of that area was hostile to Israel. Over the last 70 years, less more nations have been um, diplomatically uh, accepting Israel over time. Less of those states have been, are, are, they're more neutral. 
But that's the way it was in 1948. Every single one of those areas, states in the Middle East, hostile to Israel. This is the former prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. He did a test. He was speaking to a reporter, so I'm giving him credit for this, although I think I heard it before him. He did the thumb test. I'm going back and forth here. The thumb test, and he said, this thumb is Israel, and then all the states that are, you take your hand, and there's, you could probably do like maybe four or five of them, good handprints of the states that are hostile. And so that's, that's part of what Israel is, is facing since 1948. Again, it's less and less, praise the Lord. I call him the man of steel, not because he's this great, wonderful person and that we should just love everything he does, but really he was prime minister of Israel, a state with Jewish people for 12 uninterrupted years. To get Jewish people to agree for that long is a, great, is a miracle <laughs> in and of itself. So... He, he basically, I think it was from 2006 to right after Ariel Sharon um, with the Gaza, uh, leaving Gaza, the Gaza, I forget the exact word, but they left Gaza, I think, in 2005, and then unfortunately Ariel Sharon had a stroke, and then Likud took over. Now, to understand Israel's government, and I apologize, this is kind of going to be, as Pastor Scott, this might just sound like water from a fire hydrant. So if you like this information, you give me your email, I can send you this information on a PDF as well uh, for you. So you can take notes or you can kind of sit back and just, just chill a little bit, however you want to do it. But to be prime minister of Israel, Israel's a parliamentary system, one body of government, the Knesset, 120 seats. You need 61 seats to form a governing coalition. And that coalition can change at, all to- at different times. And so your coalition is only as strong as the number of seats that are voting confidence in you. Likud, which is the party that Netanyahu ran, averaged about 35 seats for his 12 years. That means he needed another 26 seats to be prime minister. He did that for 12 years. So there has been a lot of votes and a lot of shifting of that coalition over the last 12 years. But basically, they don't have a president that they elect every four years. They have what a kind of a speaker of the house they call him prime minister and it's really the number of seats you have so 120 seats you need 61 these are some of the lists of his accomplishments i highlighted the in red some of not necessarily they're the best but they're things that really are for our discussion he's had three wars with the palestinians but interestingly enough he really hasn't had any in the last four years with the exception of may 2021 and, and i do believe don't mean to be politically incorrect here, that the former administration had a lot to do with that the last four years. And, and so, and also the Abraham Accords, something that he, he wrote with, uh, it's, and you're going to see that, we're going to talk about that, that, that Israel has had some good relations with the Saudi Persians Gulf states, or the Gulf states, and still some kind of hostile with those northern states like Syria and Iran and who knows where Iraq is right now and, and things of that nature and, and Turkey and, and those areas. And so he's had some really good relationships. And he's really, one of the things he's done is he's been very strategic and very pragmatic. He's also focused on the economy the best he has, but he's always been about safety and security. And that's why he's been able to keep his coalition together. During his time, there's been less violence um, in Israel over the last 12 years. These are the new prime ministers. Now, Naftali Bennett on the right, he's the prime minister of Israel today. He's in in an agreement that he will be prime minister for two years. And then Yair Lapid, he will be prime minister for the next two. Naftali Bennett is a very right wing and very religious and very pro temple mount, temple. Okay, so that's number one. When you think of prophetic, you think biblically, you think end times, there's three kind of important points that I look at. One, temple. There needs to be a rebuilt temple. He's in favor of lessening the restrictions, which is going to create some tension in the area. Some of the tension that goes on is because of that Temple Mount area. That's Yair Lapid. He's left. So he's a left wing. He's secular. So that's kind of interesting, too. They came together, and they really only control about 27 seats. They have 61 votes. So their coalition is very weak. I don't know if they're really going to survive two years for a center-left or a left-wing politician who, interestingly enough, really isn't as interested in the Temple Mount. So it's kind of a relationship of two uh, strange bedfellows, quote-unquote. 
One of the things, so, so that, and the, here's some highlights too. Now they both are in favor of a two-state solution and a lot of the international community is in favor of a two-state solution. But a two-state solution really, I don't know if they're both fighting over, or I should say fighting, arguing over that Temple Mount every single time. I shouldn't say every single time, I'm being somewhat hyperbolic, but most of the time when there's a, when there's a flare up, it has something to do with Jerusalem or that Temple Mount. And so that's, so when you think of the end times, you got to think Temple Mount, think Iran, and then think of the strength of the international coalition that's forming against Israel. Those are the three things I look at. Temple Mount, what's going on with the Temple Mount? Number two, what's going on with Iran and that Ezekiel 38 coalition of Iran and and turkey and possibly russia and maybe libya and ethiopia or sudan those types of states and then what's going on with the greater international coalition is there another player that is equal to israel or greater with its wealth and military and when you start seeing those things come together kind of as jesus said you need to see you know what's the writing on the wall kind of a thing you need to you need to start to look at the signs of the times and that's sort of what i what i kind of look at I want to take a brief look at the history. How did we get here? How did we get here? Well, the first thing we need to look at is the promise that God made to Abraham, because a lot of this is just a fight over a struggle in the Middle East over the land. And we have to remember our biblical. It's not just a historical foundation that we look on or a legal foundation, although those are important. And I'm going to briefly touch upon those. They're important for our for our discussion and for our outlook. But the first and foremost, the core is the biblical foundation. Genesis 12, 1 through 7, uh, this is a highlight of that. Genesis 12, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Abram, get going, leave your land and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Joshua 1, 3 through 4, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. Now, this is important because it really gives us a picture. From the wilderness, from the wilderness, meaning kind of the Saudi Peninsula, which is what we call it today. That's where the Israelites traveled through during those 40 years between Egypt and Kadesh Barnea. And this Lebanon, and as far as the great river, the Jordan, and the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. That's actually greater Israel. So that's the largest amount of territory that God really promised from the Euphrates River, the northern Euphrates, all the way down through uh, up at the top of the Saudi Peninsula, down to the Jordan, to the Great Sea, to um, even as far as the Wadi or the, the early, the beginning of Egypt up to Lebanon. And so I'm going to have a few maps here. This, uh-oh, wow, I really did something. So, there we go. So this is a few maps to give that picture for you. Um, we have, this is the time during the patriarchs. You, you probably have these in your Bibles. The time during the patriarchs where, Ab where Abram came down and he pretty much went to Shechem in the beginning, which is northern, the northern part of Israel, probably where the tribe of Dan would be in the north. And then he ultimately went to Beersheba, which is in Judah, which is uh, in the, the Negev Desert today. And so he traveled pretty much all the way from the top to the bottom, and God said, that's your land. This is during the time of the judges. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, 1 through 4, there's another rendering of this, this is your land, also in the book of Numbers, I believe, Numbers chapter 34 as well. And this is the land promised to the 12 tribes, and this is what it looked like under the judges. And that brown tip part the Euphrates River travels all the way to there. So it was pretty much, this is, this is it for the most part, greater Israel, a little bit higher probably in the north, but this is pretty much the promised land. And this is like a land bridge too. So what's really unique about this area is that it's a land bridge to Asia and Southern Europe and North Africa and of course the Saudi Peninsula. And so this, and, and what part of the reason I believe God put his people there is to be a witness. That as trade routes and people would go through there, they would hear about the one true God, the creator, the redeemer, and hopefully they would come and, and be saved. And really, that's our role. We're supposed to live out our faith. We're supposed to be this like 
this expression of God, and, and people hopefully will get um, convicted and receive his grace and, and believe. That's our prayer. So this is during the time of the judges, before there was a king. This uh, on the right is the time, and that, so that would be like the, 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 another on the right, that's David and Solomon's territory. That's a very large, that would be kind of, again, the larger, greater Israel. And then on the left, remember, and I don't have time to go through all of that part, but Israel divided after Solomon into a southern kingdom, which is Judea, which is where we get the word Jew, Jewish, and then the northern ten tribes that ultimately went into captivity under Assyria. And so that's, that's a picture under the biblical times. And then this is during the time of Jesus, where again, you can see during the time of Jesus, it's all pretty much biblically, historically been about the same area. Now, Judea is more of a, if you're going to say like neighborhoods, those are like the, the, the full-blooded Jews or the, the Jews that, that kind of feel like, you know, we're the closest to, to David, and so they may be a little bit more, you know, that, that's been historically the most, how do I put it, just the, the Jewish area that's been Jewish traditionally good and then you have galilee or galilee of the nations which has kind of more of a mix of jewish people and non-jewish people and then you have samaria which is kind of that mix that where the samaritans are where when the syrians came in and took over the northern tribe they created kind of a, a, a race of jewish people and assyrians and they're called the samaritans the samarian samaritans and but they still follow the, te- the the first five books of the bible and they still are considered kind of have Jewish DNA, Jewish blood. And I believe there's a big Samaritan population and they're citizens of Israel today. And so, so they're an important historical group. And then the, the Kopolis and Perea have been traditionally more um, non-Jewish areas, but still kind of part of that greater promise. And then this is the, just a recap of the, the periods, the the, the uh, patriarchal period or the Canaan period, and then Judges, United Kingdom, divided, and then Judean. All right, again, I, I apologize if I'm going a little bit fast, but you can, I can get you these, uh, this information. Now, this is Israel in the land of the Second Temple. That southern kingdom in 603 B.C. would go off into captivity under Babylon, and the time of the Gentiles, and what is my definition of the time of the Gentiles is when Gentiles controlled Jerusalem. And really, that went on from 603 B.C. all the way to 1967, with the exception of the Hasmonean period. What is the Hasmonean period? That's Hanukkah, my favorite holiday growing up, because we got eight presents. Until I said to my mom, why do we have to have eight little presents? The Christians are all getting one big one. Can we, we'll light the candles, but can we have the one big present? She said, sure. It was easier for her, too. You know, you can only get so many socks and tennis balls before you're like, it's a little remote control car. Anyway, so up ex- with the exception of Hasmonean and, and Judah Maccabee. And the Hasmonean, you know, just as an aside, this, the, the Maccabees are, are part of the lore of the Jewish people, especially Judah Maccabee. He's that messianic figure that they're looking for. When Yeshua, when Jesus came, it wasn't a far-fetched thing to think we can, we can get our freedom back. They had just done it 100, 150 years earlier. That memory was more in their mind than anything David had done or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had done. That was just, that's like us kind of thinking about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. And so they had done it with the Seleucid Greeks, and they wanted to do it again with another military leader like Judah Maccabee. But just but not to say, you know, but to say something, you know, because I love reading about Judah Maccabee. He was, a, he was a really a holy man. I mean, he was a holy warrior. He would go off into battle singing hymns and fasting. And they, in the beginning of the war, they wouldn't even fight on the Shabbat. If the, if the Seleucids were coming, they would just, some of their army would just get slaughtered because they're like, we can't, we can't work on the Sabbath. And then they later changed that. But that's where they were coming from. And so this is during the time of the Second Temple. In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And you go to Jerusalem today, to this very day, there is no more temple. On, and so again, that's one of the things. We're looking for that third temple. And Naftali Bennett is pro-Temple Mount. I don't know if they have a lot of things of him saying, hey, I want another temple. But he won, and he just kind of got into trouble just a few weeks ago where he, he basically said, you can pray on the Temple Mount. 
That's a no-no. Jewish people are not allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. They're only allowed to go up twice a day under designated hours. Why is that? Because even though Israel controls the West Bank and, New Jer and Jerusalem in general, militarily and, and politically, the Temple Mount is controlled by the Muslim Waqf. W-A-Q-F. Waqf. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And they control it. And so there's a status quo agreement that's been during, since, uh, I believe, the Ottoman Empire. And every time that status quo gets broken, there's usually a flare-up. And so when he said you could pray on the Temple Mount, it was bubbling over. And Yair Lapid, his, he's, the, he's the minister of uh, foreign minister, and he's going to supposedly be prime minister in two years. He said, well, we got to back down off of that. But it gives us an insight into his thinking. Third temple. Second temple destroyed. 70 AD under the Romans, third temple. I can't go through all this, but that's a list of other empires between 70 AD and 1948 that have controlled the Temple Mount, or at least the, the Gentiles, that, yeah, that have been, in, and, and Israel in general, until 1948 when Israel became a land. This is Mark Twain. This is what he said about the Holy Land in 1867. To give you a picture of what people thought of the Holy Land, in 1867, right? Uh, it wasn't like the Jewish people came in and there was this great thing going on and they just took it. There was really, it was, it was barren. It, was, it wasn't wasteland per se. There was some fertile ground there, but nobody was really doing anything with it. Jerusalem was really under-inhabited. Now, there's always been a Jewish presence in Jerusalem, about 20 to 25,000 very religious Jews, very messianic looking for the Messiah, very ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Jerusalem that had come back after 70 AD and after the second revolt in 134 AD and, and basically praying at the, at the Wailing It was called the Wailing Wall until just recently. Now it's the Western Wall. But when I grew up, it was called the Wailing Wall. But they, they were there, they've been there, but it was pretty much, this is Mark Twain in 1867. He visited the Holy Land. This is what he had to say about it. A desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route. Hardly a tree or shrub anywhere, even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil had almost deserted the country. I mean, it's a, it's a man. I mean, this is just a little over 100 years ago. But Israel returns. So what's happened in Israel today is a fulfillment of prophecy. You cannot get around it as much as you want to, or maybe, I'm not saying you personally, but as much as people want to. Everything that is happening is really an unfolding of Scripture. If you, if you want to really say, is this all true? Am I just sort of just walking down the primrose path? Just look at Israel and look at these prophecies. I'm just taking a nice little assortment, really an expository assortment, because I know you're a church, you don't want me to just you know, grab stuff willy-nilly. So I just took Ezekiel, which is, this is the great passage about Israel's returning. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from the nations. Now Ezekiel wrote in about 6590-ish, B.C. So this is 2,500 years roughly prior to this being fulfilled. I will take you from the nations. So Israel had to be in the nations. Gather you out of all the countries and back and bring you back to your own land. So Israel had to be dispersed, which it was. See, I look at 603 B.C. to 70 A.D. as captivity, and I look at 70 A.D. up until the modern state as exile. They were exiled. They were dispersed. And they, God has slowly been bringing them back until he ultimately brought them back into their land. And so in 1947, now I said we've laid the biblical, now we're looking at the legal. People argue about well, what's important and how do they get... 1947, November... Sorry, it all got jumbled there. But November 29th, 1947. If you love Israel and you want to make an apologia for Israel, you've got to know this date. November 29th, 1947, there was a UN vote. And that UN vote basically voted, it needed to be 60, I think 67% of the General Assembly voted in favor of making a partition of this, of quote unquote Palestine. 33 yes, 13 no, 10 abstentions, and that's the legal right for Israel to be in the land. Today. Legal, not biblical, but the modern state. Okay? And that's the original partition. It's also. That's the original partition. Now, unfortunately, what ended up happening was there was a war 
right after that. And there's been subsequent wars between Israel and her Arab nature, natures. And that, that area that was given to the um, Palestinians has obviously has unfortunately, really I say unfortunately, shrunk. Every time there's a new conflict, sadly, and we need to pray for the Palestinian people, we need to pray for them to come to faith, and we need to pray for them to have a place of rest. And I think Israel wants to do that. At least when I go to Israel, there's a number of Israelis that want to do that. And I think there's a number of Palestinians that want to do that. They do need a place of rest, whether it's in Israel or whether it's in an Arab state or, or whether it's in a quote-unquote second state. They, they, and I think God wants to do that for them, but not at the expense of his name. And Israel shares with God's, you know, Israel, one who struggles with El or Prince of El, Prince of God. This is Ezekiel 36, 34. The land that was desolate will be tilled instead of being a wasteland in the sight of all that pass by. They will say this land that was a wasteland has become like a garden of Eden. The waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. And remember what Mark Twain said. The land blooms. This is the Jezreel Valley. Israel's agricultural exports are about over 30 billion a year which that doesn't seem like a lot, but in a nation of about 7 million people, 1 million Arab citizens, 6 million Jewish citizens, about 250,000 Christian citizens. So Israel, even though it calls itself the Jewish state, it's not just Jewish people that are citizens. So there are Arab citizens that do vote, and there's an Arab party that's part of the, I think, the ruling coalition for the first time in Israel's history. That's the Jezreel Valley. Now, if you look at Israel per capita in their agricultural export, they're a second behind the United States if you took their population and expanded out to the size of ours. Very, very, uh, so that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Jerusalem, the uninhabited city being inhabited. There's Jerusalem, again, since 1967, under Jewish control, but the Temple Mount is still as part of the settlement, too, in 1967, the Six-Day War, which is an extremely important and significant event because Israel got, um, received the West Bank and the Golan Heights and um, Gaza, they still allowed the Waqf, the, the Muslim ruling party, to run the Temple Mount. So if you go to Israel, first couple of times I went to Israel, I couldn't go on the Temple Mount. The Muslims were not allowing anybody the last two I have been. It's really powerful. It's really special. And I will say this. I, I'm just throwing this out there. There's room for a temple up there. It's a big area. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is way to the south. This is the Dome of the Rock, which is sort of center but offset. And then as you come through the eastern gate, which is sealed uh, to the temple, there's a lot of room. You can build a Solomonic temple right there. So if there is some kind of weird sort of agreement where both are kind of at peace for three and a half years you could have a temple functioning right next to the golden quote unquote dome of the rock golden dome so uh just food for thought i did bring that up to an israeli once i said is that possible and they laughed at me so <laughs> there goes my theory um but you know the man of lawlessness the man of sin with his deception is he could broker an agreement that, that it, it could or it could just be part of a, of a, of a collapse. I mean, the, but I don't want to necessarily speculate how a third temple would be built, but I do want to say that's what we should be looking for because we need a third temple for the abomination of desolation and the man of sin, the man of lawlessness to, re, to reveal himself as antichrist, as a false messiah in the temple. And so that's why a temple would be important. This is Tel Aviv. The rebuilt city is Jerusalem. But the city's really coming out of the desolate places, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a, I'm sorry, a Tel Aviv. Jerusalem's a rebuilt city. Tel Aviv is a city built out of the desolate because there was no city there in 1909. It's built next to the ancient city of Joppa. It was, I think, orange trees. And now it's Israel's largest city with a greater population of over 3 million. The greater Tel Aviv area. I think Tel Aviv Central is about a million. And then this is Haifa. I've been to Haifa once. It's kind of a sticking point between me and my wife. Please don't bring it up. She wants to go to Haifa. I haven't brought her there yet. So, <laughs> But that's Haifa. It's considered Israel's most beautiful city. And again, these cities have Jews and Arabs, non-Jews, living there. So there is, there is um, it's not just for Jewish people. 
Israel's return, God's prophecy fulfilled, Ezekiel 36, 36. Then the nations that I are left all around you will know that I, Adonai, which is a kind of a rabbinic way to say Lord or God's name, have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, so I will do it. Now, I don't know if this prophecy has been totally fulfilled yet, but I think, I think first just the miracles of Israel's survival as well as these Arab states coming into peace with Israel over the years has, whether they admit it publicly or not, made them think, you know, they're here to stay. Something's going on. I think so. I think some of those Arab states that have, con- like Egypt, Jordan, so those are two significant, and then these Abraham Accords with uh, Bahrain and UAE, and also, even though I don't think Saudi Arabia is in an agreement, they, they're, they're in economic relations with Israel, as well as, believe it or not, Somalia and Sudan. So I think some of that is, is a kind of a tacit acclamation of, of God's, somebody's doing something. This is just a map of Israel's changing borders over the last uh, 70 years. Oh, I went the wrong way. So this is Israel in the Gulf states. This is just recently the Abrahamic Accords, one of Netanyahu and President Trump's last sort of international things before they left power. Um, the Gaza Wars, the Temple. So there's been a number of wars with Gaza, primarily uh, the Palestinian leadership in Gaza. I don't have time to go through all of them. I just highlighted the Temple Mount crisis and May crisis because both of those have to do with the Temple Mount. I was in Jerusalem with a group of youth when that exploded. I actually flew in, was overcoming my jet lag when somebody woke me up and said, the Temple Mount's, you know, in crisis. And I, I confess to say, I said, how far is it away? Because <laughs> I was just like, uh. And they said about three kilometers. I said, wake me when it's about one, one and a half. <laughs> of course, then I woke up a couple hours, loaded up the van, and we drove off to Masada because where would any good Jewish zealot go when things are in <laughs> crisis but Masada? And we had fun climbing Masada in the 120-degree heat. But, you know, again, changing status quo um, and, and the, the argument over the Temple Mount. Same thing with this May crisis that just happened. Uh, the issue was an area right near the Temple, and the Israeli Supreme Court was evicting a Palestinian neighborhood, and again, very tragic, very sad. You know, I'm not, you know, individually, it's hard, you know, Israel's a secular government, so we want to look at it in terms of God's perspective and the Bible perspective. Not everything the nation of Israel or the government of Israel does, it, we should, we have to say, oh, rah, rah, we have to look at it from God's perspective, but there was Palestinian neighborhood near the Temple Mount, in Jerusalem, so Jerusalem also, the Temple Mount Jerusalem, as that status may change, um, as well as the West Bank, there's going to be crisis and flare-up. But again, I'm looking for, as, as a watcher of Scripture, prophecy, eschatology, I'm looking for that Temple Mount, I'm looking for the coalitions, because Gaza, Hamas especially, Hezbollah in Lebanon, they are allies, proxies of Iran. So a lot of times when Hamas or Hezbollah does something, it's really Iran. And so that's part of the Ezekiel coalition. And when Iran does something, that could be part of Russia. Because Iran gets some of its backing from Russia and maybe China. China and Russia, that's always a little bit more... I'm not so much concerned about Iran as just somebody who looks at these things. But when China and Russia, now that, that becomes concerning. Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran. You can see Iran, Hezbollah's in Lebanon, and, Ham- and, and Hamas is in Gaza. They're very, especially Hezbollah and Hamas, they're right on the border. So Iran is part of that, usually part of that. Um, this, it says 1 Thessalonians, it's 2 Thessalonians. Wow, I really messed that up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 7. Read it, know it. If you want to understand the end times from a new covenant perspective, you need to read and own 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians 2 through 7. Basically, we have a culture of lawlessness, verse 7. The great falling away, which is the church, us. There's going to be a falling away of the church or a weakening. Uh, the rapture, 
man of lawlessness, rebuilt temple, abomination, desolation. It's Paul's distillation, and that's really what we should be looking at. You know, and right now, sadly, we are kind of more and more going toward a culture of lawlessness. The church in America and in the West is struggling with its faith, and, and, and the belief in the biblical inerrancy is, is sadly dropping. Um, so those are things we need to be looking at. Finally, the nation repents. And so the big five, I've already kind of touched on these. I'm giving you the biblical markers or addresses. A rebuilt temple, we see that in Daniel 9, 27, as well as in Thessalonians. Thessalonians, Paul talks about the man of sin in the temple. And that word temple is not the traditional word temple that's used by the apostles when talking about the structure. It's the word, non, I believe, nanos, which is talking about the holy of holies. So it's not just the temple. He's very, very specific. He will be in the holy of holies like the high priest, which is really like we have a high priest now. His name is Jesus. He sits on the right. Psalm 16, 10 and 11. Who's that? Do you know that your holy one CDK? At your right hand, Jesus, our high priest. So when he goes into the nanos, the holy of holies, so a rebuilt temple, the battle of Gog and Magog, what are we looking for? We are looking for Every time Hamas and Hezbollah does something, I'm saying every, most times Hamas and Hezbollah does something, it could be Iran as well. When Iran does something, it could be Russia or China, one of its greater backers. And when Russia or China, it now is that international coalition. And that, and I'll just kind of close with this, that leads us to Zechariah 12.10. That's the international coalition. Rebuilt temple, the Ezekiel coalition, and then the international coalition. And I'm just going to end with reading from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, because this is something, this is my joy as an outreach worker to the Jewish people. My joy, my prayer is no matter how bad, scary, difficult things get, no matter what we see from our favorite commentator or what negative or things that make us anxious, we know that it's all going to end well. We know, and, and, and from my theological perspective, the final, I don't call it the great tribulation because there's been other tribulations that have been terrible for many believers throughout. But I call it the final and great, because it's going to be big, but it's going to be final. And that's for Israel. That's to get national Israel to repent. So think about it in terms of that. What is going to take that loving, beautiful, stiff-necked Jewish people to turn that neck and say, you are the Messiah, you are God? Well, it is these fulfilled prophecies. That, that helps the remnant, people like me. The fulfilled prophecies help the remnant see. Isaiah 53, Ezekiel 36, Zechariah 12, 10. But that army coming toward Jerusalem in the end, that international coalition, that failure of man-made peace during the tribulation, that is going to, and, and the coming one, that is going to get national Israel to say, you are the Messiah. Zechariah 12, verse 9 and 10 says this. Uh, there it is. On that day, that's that day, that is the eschatological last days, I will make the clans of Judah, sorry, that's verse 6. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. It doesn't say temple there, but the temple's in Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they've pierced, him, look on me, look on him. So this is the Messiah talking, him, me, the Godhead talking. When they look upon me, they will weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn, the only begotten. That's what we're ultimately looking for. So this message, what's going on, as we close, what should we do? We need to watch. We need to look. We need to pray. And I really want you to, I mean, I would encourage you to pray for the, the Palestinian people, that they would find peace. Pray for the Jewish people, that they would find peace. And ultimately, pray for the church, that they would grow strong in the word, trust in where God is taking us, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to Jesus, listen to the word of God, and do his will in these final days. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Israel. And I thank you for this church. 
bless those church because they are staying, they're strong in the word, Lord. Help them as you help me and help your body to follow you properly and in a way that pleases you doing your will.